Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone, for starting with uh, Professor Anuradha Mishra for inviting me for this series and even more importantly for organizing this series. Uh, it's been absolutely wonderful for me to listen to so many wonderful speakers whom I know already before, such as Bala here. So brings back happy memory and even more uh, happy to connect with so many wonderful teachers. Um, without these teachers, I can say 100%, I would not even be close to where I am today. Um, so I'm extremely grateful. Um, and maybe I should say that in the order in which things happen, I'm told that I should say a few words about where I came from and my interaction with Bombay University and what we have start. Uh, we can do that. So give me one sec. Um, let's uh, make this screen large and let's now go ahead and share screen. So can everybody see this? Uh, it's coming up. Can everybody see this? Yes. Yes. Sir. yes. Your Wonderful. So I will be talking, oops, there's something has been enabled here which draws lines on it. Thank you. So I will uh, talk about uh, neurons. So how did I come about thinking about neurons? Um, when I was in India, I didn't really know the word neurons actually. I knew there is something called the brain and I was curious about a lot of things. Eventually, uh, I must uh, say where I came from. I grew up in Kurla. Uh, my house was not this bad. Uh, we were right across the road from this area. So needless to say, there was not much to fall back on. Uh, there were no books uh, we could afford. Uh, the books were from donations. There was no library we could have because the school didn't have any library at all. Um, Right next to my home, there was a gambling den, pretty much next to this area. It's called Matka, as uh, many of you might know. Illegal gambling den. So very early on in my life, I learned that numbers matter. You got to know numbers. Uh, again, somebody's drawing things that I'm not drawing. Uh, funny things are happening on this. So that jokes apart, I was very curious about science and I ended up going to Khalsa College. The very first year that I was in Khalsa College, uh, there was a murder in the college. So not exactly the best situation you can imagine, but on the other hand, I already grew up in this neighborhood, so murder didn't phase me too much. It was a normal day in my life, so that was okay. Unfortunately, the education there, apart from few courses, uh, was not as good as I might have wished. And I became thoroughly confused, especially about this amazing thing called quantum mechanics. Other things I could figure out uh, by just studying harder, but quantum mechanics didn't make any sense to me at all. What were all these funny things, uncertainty and whole radius, what are these weird things? And I was absolutely confused. Uh, I spent hours and hours in library studying by myself. Um, didn't make any sense. I managed to score well in the exams, but really that was, you know, an accident. And then I didn't know what to do with myself because I always wanted to become a scientist. And physics didn't make, quantum mechanics especially did not make sense. Relativity made sense not quantum mechanics. So what do I do there? And I remember ending up at Bombay University uh, physics department. Uh, this is how the building looked. And as I walked in already, it was quite surprising. A beautiful building, uh, no squalor. There are trees uh, in Bombay. And I remember uh, Professor Rangwala's office was on one side of the corridor. Rangdi, he was the head of the department. On the other side, I had to leave a piece of paper. And what do I major in? I thought I'll do electronics. 
But then I heard about neutrinos and I thought this neutrino business is very funny. Maybe I will just study neutrinos. So I, instead of electronics, last minute I put uh, nuclear physics. And boy, that was a good decision. Um, because the first thing that happened were lectures by Rangwala uh, and Arvind Kumar and Dr. Pradhan, many, many other people. But these three lectures stood out in my head quite a lot. The clarity that these scientists uh, and amazing teachers brought is the only reason why I understood whatever little I understood about quantum mechanics. Just like now, there was total chaos at Bombay University at that time for, un, for reasons which were no fault of Bombay University. There was social unrest. So everything had slowed down quite a lot. And our entire year had shrunk to only four or four to six months. So I remember at that point, uh, Rangwala and Arvind Kumar decided to hold a catch up lectures. They would not only teach their regular classes, but they would hold special classes during the weekends. They would come to campus on weekends and hold marathon lectures going on for three hours, six hours, teaching us the background material, the basic science and so on. Uh, not only the stuff that is new, but stuff we are supposed to know, which we didn't know because there are many of us like this. The lecturers are absolutely inspiring. Uh, not only did they know the research or the science very well, but they were passionate about it. I remember Dr. Rangwala's, uh, whom I always call Rangwala or Abbas Rangwala. His standard phrase was, if anybody could answer this question, my heart will leap with joy. And you could see that. Every now and then, when one of us got the answer right, he was thrilled. And this persisted for hours of nonstop teaching on Sundays, and it didn't stop there. Of course, many of us, uh, me especially, were thoroughly confused what the hell was this quantum mechanics that he was teaching us so very well. Have you had questions? And I had serious doubts about my abilities to do science because this damn thing didn't make sense. So I would pester him all the way to the cafeteria and he will go for dinner, or oh, sorry, lunch with me and several students and we will keep asking him questions. And fortunately for me, since I stayed in Kurla and Rangwala I used to go via Kurla to his home, I would pester him in the bus every single day. I used to wait, he may not know, for the right bus in which he would be traveling. So I'll have that extra 10 minutes. And those were wonderful times. He and uh, Arvind Kumar, they changed my life around. Without the teaching, I would know a thing about physics. I would be confused as hell and I would give up, most likely. So thank you enormously for teaching us, for giving your uh, precious time and going way over and beyond your duties to teach us. And finally, before I move on to the scientific part, I want to tell you the critical role played by Dr. Pradhan as well. Uh, I thought he, Pradhan taught us nuclear physics. That was wonderful. I enjoyed this quite a lot. And at the same time, right next to this building was library. And at that time, I learned about you know things like how Einstein worked in a post office and could do research. So I thought, you know, if Einstein could do that, I have no money. Uh, I will go to the library. And in the meantime, I'll, I took up a teaching job in Wilson College. But I'll teach in Wilson College. And in the evenings, I'll come to the library and do research. And one of the days I was walking by and Pradhan saw me. Dr. Pradhan, and he said, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm doing research. And he said, what do you mean you're doing research? Uh, I said, well, I'm doing research in the library. He said, no, no, that's silly. Uh, you got to apply for PhD. I said, where do I apply for PhD? I don't have money. He said, oh, they give you fellowship. I said, really? So it was already too late at that time for deadlines and so on. But eventually, I applied and ended up at ISC. Um, I ended up doing PhD there, Anuradha said, that's where I met uh, Dr. Anuradha Mishra. I was the errand boy for this meeting. So I wrote several papers in physics at that time. 
uh, only one paper in physical regulators, but on the other hand, I did write five papers, all of them alone. Uh, my education in Bombay University and education in ISC helped, helped me a lot. In all this, uh, now I had my own theory of how the universe began and what was the structure of space time and what was its relationship uh, with quantum fluctuations. And I won't go into that. I want to go to the main topic. The reason I ditched all these amazing things, which I was so passionate about. I had fellowship from the kind in uh, yeah, CSI, I believe, to do research wherever I wanted. But I felt that if I keep generating my own theories about how the universe began and what is the structure of time, and if nobody can test my theory, then it didn't seem right. So at that point, <clears throat> about neuroscience a little bit. So I ask you now to look at the screen for a little bit. What do you see here? So keep looking at the screen uh, if you've never seen this before. Uh, you'll see some black and white dots. Uh, you may not see anything. Uh, keep looking. dog, that's his head. Uh, those are his one, two, three, four legs. And that's his body, that's a tree, that's the ground. And now you see it. There is complete made up stuff. There's just a bunch of black and white dots. And once your brain starts to see the dog, you cannot unsee it. You have no choice. You cannot go back to the same point that you were before. So what happened? I didn't know what any, any of this was, but around the time I finished my PhD, I became aware that the brain has its own rules. Just like nature, physics has its own rules. Brain has its own rules. And I got curious to say that. I must admit that I thought I'll spend two years figuring out why our brain is able to perceive things that we never ever experience. Not only this black and white dot pattern and then we can't see, but we perceive things like quantum mechanics and relativity, which we have never experienced. It's totally counterintuitive. How do we perceive it? And I thought I'll spend two years doing it. Uh, turns out uh, it's been much longer and I haven't figured it out. And I will tell you what are the interesting challenges and uh, opportunities of fundamental science with huge impact for society, in my opinion, by this rapidly emerging field called neurophysics. So you listen to one neuron. So that was the sound of just one neuron. And can somebody tell me if you can hear it or not, or see this everything? Uh, can everybody see and hear what I'm saying? Uh, otherwise, uh, it might be tricky. So I'm going to assume that people can hear and see this. So we, we, we can see and we can hear you, but you could be a little louder. Okay, very good, thank you. Let me see if I can bring this closer. Uh, let me get a drink of water. All right, so the experiment that I showed you, this is just an oscilloscope, the one that I learned in the lab with Dr. Narsale to use oscilloscope. Um, that's a standard oscilloscope, uh, old experiment. What a person did, the experimenter did, is to take an extremely fine electrode, which is about uh, one tenth to one 50th the diameter of uh, human hair. So very fine electrode, lots of solitary science in how to make the electrodes, how to reduce its impedance, and closely bring it very close to a neuron, sometimes even inside the neuron, in an anesthetized rat. All right, and the only thing that was happening in front of the rat was somebody was just turning on just a flashlight, just a 
bright light on and off. And what you'll hear, I'll play this again, whenever somebody turned the light on, there was a sound. And you see that I have frozen the screen just one cycle. As soon as the light turned on, this one neuron made this voltage. How big is this voltage? Pretty substantial. From here to there is 100 millivolt. And it generated this spiky little activity pattern, highly nonlinear. Most of the time it was bumbling around. This goes from about, about 10 to 20 millivolt to the scale bar. This is about a second. And then it generated these spikes. And even though the person was flashing exactly the same uh, pattern, the neuron kept generating spikes, but with very different pattern. So we are going to listen to that once again. That's the currency of the neuron. Every census, there you go. You can see this. The spikes are coming all over the place. Uh, that's where the neurons become active. Their voltage fluctuates around 10 millivolts and something happens, they go non-linear. They generate something called action potential or spikes that are 100 millivolts. So neurons are supposed to be binary, zeros or ones. Zero is when it bumbles around by about 10 millivolts. One is when it just goes totally nonlinear, literally in scientific way by 100 millivolts. So computers are built on that uh, digital principle. This is our brain. And the question is, how does the brain create intelligence and ability to create knowledge? to perceive things that we never have experienced, such as this picture of black hole behind me, or surrounding medium behind me. Now, if neurons are binary, why can't we, we, we have lots of things. We have integrated circuits, which are also made up of transistors, which are binary. But transistors and circuits cannot, despite their amazing achievements, such as allowing us to talk, they cannot create this knowledge. So what's missing here? So the standard answer often given is that our brain is amazing. It has 10 raised to 11 neurons. And that's true. Our brain has roughly 10 raised to 11 neurons, which is a lot of neurons. It can much more than number of stars in the galaxy, so on and so forth. But uh, my foot has uh, more than 10 raised to 11 cells. My foot is no longer not anywhere as interesting as the neurons or the brain. So that's not the answer. Well, you can say, well, the neurons are active and the foot, it's all bone and cells and they are not active. Uh, transistors are active. They go zero and one and they can be controlled. And by now, people have made computers with more than 10 raised to 11 neurons. Way more, trillion neurons are already available. But they're still not anywhere close to many things we can do. So why not? Uh, maybe the brain is very, very fast. Maybe it's not the number of neurons, but the speed at which we operate. You saw those spikes. Uh, that's when the brain neurons talk to each other. Those spikes last one millisecond, which means that the brain's clock speed is about a kilohertz. Well, you know already, that this computer on which you are watching this talk, it goes at gigahertz, way faster. So now this little computer in front of you uh, can have a lot more neurons. It moves way faster and still nothing close to the kind of things we can do. There is this huge race for artificial intelligence. So how do we start? Well, there is another funny thing. Our brain takes only 20 watts of energy to do all this wonderful thing that it does or doesn't do. And a computer of this size uh, will take, uh, sorry, uh, uh, 10 raised to 11 neurons, so it'll take 20 kilowatts, thousand times more energy. So how come our brain is able to do these things and still consume so little energy? Now we are back to basic physics questions. The system elements are zeros or ones, binary. We can think of them as spins. And in fact, many theories of brain function are based on icing model or zeros or ones or bunch of 
uh, antiferromagnets interact with each other. Very simple idea, gives you memory and so on, but it doesn't work. Turns out there are three main features of the brain that are different from computers. The brain is slow, only one kilohertz. It is sloppy because these spikes you saw, even when I was, the experiment was doing exactly the same experiment, turning on exactly the same bright dot of light, you got a totally different response. Highly noisy, coefficient of variation defined as standard deviation divided by the mean of activity defined suitably is one. Standard deviation is proportional to unity, no matter what you do. So the brain is highly sloppy. Every element, every synapse, every neuron, highly sloppy. And then on top of it, we are all sleeping half the time. Computers don't need to sleep, they are sleeping. So the idea that I will try to focus on is that these so-called bugs in the system, a slow system, a sloppy or a noisy system, and a system that needs to sleep. Perhaps those unique bugs or weaknesses that one might call the brain, I wish I didn't have to sleep. Maybe they are the features that make us special. So how? Um, so how do I go about asking questions about abstract ideas? Because I need to listen to individual neurons and there are way too many neurons in the brain. I can put myself in an F MRI scanner, but MRI scanner, which comes from using basic physics of magnetic resonance, uh, that gives a resolution of only one millimeter or so in temporal resolution of one second. Whereas neurons are micrometers in size, and then they are fast compared to second. They go at the scale of one millisecond. And I can't put electrodes in human brain, let alone my brain, because that's not allowed. So we develop techniques where without hurting animals, we anesthetize them, put extremely fine microwires. They don't kill neurons. They thread in the space between neurons. And they can measure the activity of neurons in a rat brain or a mouse brain. Okay, we can do that. And the neuronal sound that you get from a mouse brain or a rat brain, and the way the neurons look are pretty much the same as whatever people have looked at inside the human brain. Sometimes when the patients have to undergo surgery, they listen to neurons in the human brain as well. They sound exactly the same as rat brain sound. But humans are very complex. We know quantum mechanics. Uh, animals don't seem to know. So how can then we ask animals whether they have anything like abstract ideas? Maybe they don't know abstract ideas. Maybe they just know food, danger, and that's all there is to it. That was the puzzle that bothered me to say, all right, the brain is interesting, but do animals have abstract ideas. And upon some reflection and a lot of reading, I realized that actually there is something fundamental going on that is back to the same thing called space and time. Uh, you have this bird, an Arctic term, that goes from South Pole to North Pole uh, around the world without any GPS system, with a tiny little bird brain, doesn't get lost, can end up in the tiny same neighborhood. So it has an amazing sense of space, but not only that, it has a sense of time too. The sense of space and time that the bird has allows it to dive in and pick up a tiny little fish from the water. That means that the concept of space and time that the bird generated must be shared exactly by the concept of space and time created by the fish brain, even though fish lives underwater and the bird flies in the air. Because if they did not agree, either the birds will be too quick and catch all the fish and the birds will get fat and die and all the fish will die. Or if the fish were just a little too smart about space and time, then birds will always be hungry and fish will get too fat. So this so-called space and time that we take for granted, 
you are like now looking at the screen in front of you. You see some bunch of patterns on the screen, which is fine, but on top of it, you also have a clear sense of space between you and the computer screen. And if I were to ask you that in half a minute, without looking at your clock, stick your finger halfway between you and computer screen, you can do it. And I can ask you what's there. You'll say, well, there is space, but you can't see it. You only see the walls. You don't see the space in between. This is all made up. It can be messed up by artificial means too. So what is that space and time that animals too have? So my idea was that every creature on the planet, as soon as it moves, must have some concept of space and time. If we understand how the concept of space and time is created, then we can understand a lot of other things and we can all go ahead and do interesting. So here's the brain, as I told you, the brain has 100 billion neurons. And that's not the magic, that's clearly important, but not necessarily 100 billion because birds have far smaller number of neurons and they still have the same concept of space as us in time. So one thing that makes the brain special that is very hard to implement in hardware is the number of connections between neurons. Each neuron in the brain listens to 10,000 other neurons. It gets input from 10,000 other neurons. And then the output of that neuron, those spiky little things, that voltage, leads to some message being broadcast by this neuron to 10,000 other neurons. So these connections are called synapses. And unlike the connections in a computer, uh, which are solid uh, piece of wire, which is a fixed resistor or a capacitor. These connections are changing all the time. And that's where the memory is supposed to be stored. It's very hard to create that. Not that scientists have studied this for a long time and the brain is amazingly complex circuit. Right underneath here is your eye. Information from your eyes, as soon as the light, whatever images that are on the screen are translated into this bunch of spikes, goes through all these stations. The sounds that you're hearing right now, that so-called auditory cortex, there to sound the movement of some hair cells in your ear, behind the eardrum, goes through another giant circuit and goes, keeps going forward. Every sense that you have, the body or your brain turns every sensory experience, food, smell, texture, anything, sight, sound, smell, all of that into this universal language of zeros and ones. And has its own dedicated circuit. This is a circuit just for vision, similar circuit for elsewhere. So where do I go study for abstraction? Well, at the other end from the census is this structure called HC or hippocampus. So I thought, well, if you go far away from census, maybe that's where I should go. That structure far away from the census uh, is called hippocampus. There are many other structures far away from sensory cortices too, but I'm just going to focus on that. Unfortunately, hippocampus does a lot of things. Uh, it gets busted or damaged due to a whole range of diseases. Earliest age in life, autism, epilepsy, later in life, PTSD or depression, and much later in life, Alzheimer's. And just the cost of treating Alzheimer's disease will become 5 trillion by 2030. And we have no cure for many of these things, despite tremendous amount of research. And these are all problems with memory and learning. In fact, many of us think that some of us are smarter and others are not so smart. Maybe just this system not working well, and we just take it for granted, just like, I don't know, 500 years ago, if something was wrong with you, either it was a tummy ache or the witch possessed you, and we just think, oh, we are just different, but why? Maybe there is some answer there. People have been studying hippocampus, as somebody mentioned, the limbic system. It was supposed to encode emotions and so on. Turns out, if you listen to individual neuron in hippocampus, they encode space. And you listen to how the hippocampus makes maps of space. And I'll give it away to you how that's going to come about. Whenever the hippocampus becomes active, and you'll see how, not only these individual neurons create amazing pattern, but the collection of neurons generate a specific rhythm, and you'll be able to hear the rhythm. So there's something about the brain song. 
and you cannot introspect about it because we all think yeah yeah i know the song makes sense i remember songs that's why i remember songs better we should stop introspecting just like you cannot introspect about how the computer's hardware works you can introspect about what your typing did but you have no idea what went underneath your computer so the word appear on the screen similarly the neurons are generating spikes they're generating rhythms these are gigantic events electrical events still we can't perceive them we just perceive that oh i just walked or i saw something so we should stop introspecting and treat that as science of its own merit which does its own thing which we don't have introspection we can introspect about the mind but not the neurons turns out that that rhythm that hippocampus generates about eight hertz i can say that about that speed uh, that rhythm goes away when you fall asleep so something interesting the rhythm is not always present in fact when you stop and stop doing walking around the rhythm slows down the hippocampus doesn't go entirely away and when you sleep the rhythm goes away 80 percent of your sleep is so-called non-REM sleep where there are no conscious dreams and then maybe 10 to 20 percent of sleep is REM sleep and during the REM sleep the same rhythm comes back campus interesting why does that REM sleep generate the rhythm and what is rhythm got to do with space and sleep and so on and i'm trying to quickly show you how this might work so let's dive in to something more uh, here is how the brain looks something this is one single neuron in neocortex the structure right underneath your skull uh, this neuron, you can see the scale bar is about one millimeter long, roughly. That's the thickness of the neocortex, so one to two millimeters. These tiny little thing here is the cell body or the soma. Every cell in your body in a living organism has a soma or the cell body. That's about 10 to 20 micrometers. What is 10 to 20 micrometers? That is about... Uh, Human hair tip is 200 micrometers, so much tinier, but way bigger than a transistor in, the, in your computer. But what is even more interesting is that the neurons have these long processes. These processes are two kinds, they are called dendrites. Dendrites are where these neurons have these synaptic connections, the inputs arrive on the dendrite, and then it gives output along the axon. <clears throat> these are gigantic. No other cells have this humongous structure. They are just this tiny. These connections are where the inputs arrive. These are several different neurons, all packed together. They parcel into interesting structures. We are going to listen to the activity of just the cell body by using, instead of one electrode, four microelectrodes so we can do triangulation. And just like if there are sounds all around you in a room, by listening to the sounds from two years, by stereo principle, you can detect sounds of many people. We are going to listen to one neuron while a rat is walking around in a room. And these electrodes are very fine, as I said. They can be right next to a neuron without killing it and without hurting the rat. The electrodes are implanted during surgery, which is with the highest standard, like human surgery, so they don't feel pain at the time and they recover and within half an hour they are sturdy enough animals they start running around within half an hour of coming out of anesthesia so i'm going to show you an experiment which we did in our lab where there's a rat that's running around in a maze and it's one of the nicest experiments you can think of it's called chocolate rain it, the experimenter is just throwing little bits of chocolate and like us the rats too like chocolate and he has to just walk around pick up this shower of chocolate that's coming in and nothing else. The idea is that even though he's running after bits of chocolate, his brain must keep track of space and time. How does it do that? Because we don't have to pay attention to have perception of space. So let's listen to this one neuron. So it's a top down view in a two meter by two meter maze that's a rat's running. So the walls are very colorful. This is the rendering of a rat. And the crackle is the sound of one neuron out of a billion. 
you hear a rhythm. It's not just each spike, but they come together in an interesting rhythm. Right. So this data, even though we record in our lab, uh, this discovery was made in 1970s. Uh, that even though this so-called limbic system, which is supposed to be emotions and so on, instead of that, this one single neuron seems to know this spot. It seems to be active in this spot in a noisy fashion, as I told you, and not elsewhere. And the later part, I speeded up the rendering because otherwise we'll be here for one hour listening to this neuron. And it never gets old, it never gets boring. After decades of doing this research, there are amazing patterns here. And we made sure that this room was the kind of room that the rat would have never seen in his life before. We made the walls some psychedelic colors. The floor was circular. We are throwing random dots of food. And still, this neuron was active more or less here, nowhere else. And that one neuron is active here. And as I mentioned, we can now put hundreds of these very, very fine electrodes. Still, the total area covered by the electrode is as much as maybe two to three human hair, no more than that. And with that, we can measure the activity of hundreds of neurons. One neuron may be active here, other here, third here, fourth here, and so on. And therein comes the first major mystery. How did this neuron know this spot? What was so special about this spot? Why here? And why was the other neuron here? What determines the resolution of these neurons sense of space. The resolution is about, this maze, as I said, is two meters, so it's half a meter. You can say, come on, Mike. So the maze is two meter by two meter, and this neuron's sense of space is half a meter. That's not enough for me to reach out to my computer, let alone reach out and grab a glass of water. So that's not good enough. Well, it turns out the language of the neurons is just like quantum mechanics, it is a matrix operation, not a scalar operation, as Rangwala taught us. The simplest way to think about quantum mechanics is to think of matrices. Uh, as he used to tell us the joke about Heisenberg, he used to raise his hands and say, but they don't commute. A times B is not the same as B times A. The same deal is true for neurons. Put simply, it's not the activity of one neuron, but the vectorial pattern of activity of many, many neurons. That's the one that other neurons listen to because each neuron is listening to not one neuron, but 10,000 other neurons. Turns out that even though in this spatial mapping part of the brain, you have about a million neurons, give or take, depending on species, if you listen to only 100 neurons, instead of a million, just 100, you can tell where the rat is in space without looking at him with about that much resolution, less than a centimeter. And in fact, using extremely simple algorithm that we can develop in our lab, which are entirely biological. So the story turns upside down. How come the true language of the brain, the vectorial language, which we know works, because if I just do an experiment and hit my head, hundreds of neurons will die from impact, but I'll still continue talking reasonably. How come now, instead of too little information, the brain has so much information about space? So that 100 neurons have more information about the space, and I'll show you about time as well, even though you're not paying attention to it, and your conscious brain does not have the ability to tell where you are with half a centimeter accuracy. If I were to take it out of your room, bring it back to the room and put you in front of the computer away by half a centimeter, you wouldn't know it was half a centimeter away. But just 100 neurons have that much accuracy. So one puzzle that many of us are trying to explain is that on one hand, the neurons are highly sloppy, or on the other hand, they have way too much information that we, as in our mind, don't have conscious access to. Why is that? So for all those three youngsters who want to figure out the brain and so on, that's your problem number one to solve. But then while I was working on that, 
I got curious to say, okay, before I go there, I need to figure out what is that space? Why this space? Why did this neuron become active here and another neuron here? What made them active here? These neurons are so interesting that they are called place cells because the name suggests they active at one spot. And this discovery got a Nobel Prize just four or five years ago because that told us that our brain itself has its own seemingly GPS system, but the question is how did it come about? So that's how we have a map of space. If you took a top-down view of that image, this is a rat running around. These thin blue lines are the trajectory of the rat that we are rendering for you. To our knowledge, there is no trajectory on the ground. And this neuron, each dot is a spike from one place cell out of a billion or a million. And this neuron is in noisy fashion encoding maybe two spots. And sometimes they do two, sometimes one, but mostly, and there's some few spikes here and there, but mostly here. How did this come about? Well, one possibility is that this is nothing to do with humans because rats are walking around right next to the ground. The nose is next to the ground. The eyes are next to the ground. Uh, maybe they're smelling the floor, whereas we are a meter plus from the ground. So maybe it has nothing to do with what our brain does. Then why study rats to figure out human learning and memory in Alzheimer's disease? Because rats are next to the ground and they're just smelling bits of chocolate. And human beings are walking around in space. And even though we are processing space in hippocampus, uh, maybe this is not abstract space at all. So what do we do with this? We thought, OK, let's do a very clean experiment. We decided to build a virtual reality for rats. Because if you put them on the ground, no matter how much you clean the floor, they, can, they have amazing whiskers. The whiskers are so sensitive that they can pick up movement by 0.3 degrees, which is more, way more sensitive than your fingertip. So how, let's, let's remove the sense of smell and we can never remove all the little cracks on the floor which they can perceive potentially, or the smell. So we say, all right, we're going to build this virtual reality system for a rat, but a healthy one, so it can be used for humans as well. So, million dollars later from amazing funding agency called Keck Foundation. When I went and told them 10 years ago that we want to study the rat brain to understand using virtual reality, he said, what do you want to do? Rats in virtual reality? Are you sure? This sounds even worse than asking rats to watch TV, which seems totally, utterly useless. But they were kind enough to listen to us and it paid off well. So the rat stays on this giant styrofoam ball uh, the ball is hollowed out, but still we had to make sure that when the rat takes a step, it feels like it took a real step, so it has to be locally flat. It can't be a tiny ball. Otherwise, he, he, have a different, he has a different experience. Uh, the ball has, is being floated by a hovercraft mechanism so that the weight feels like 1.6 times the body weight, which people have figured out for us as well is when we think we took a natural step. Otherwise, we feel we are going downhill or it's too much of an uphill. The movement of the ball is picked up by these microcontrollers all around. Goes to a virtual reality engine written in the lab by brilliant students in the lab. That gets delivered by a Pico projector that I found on an airplane once in an airplane magazine. Size of your hand. That's enough. The image is grainy, but right vision is not as good as us, so that's fine. Goes to this mirror that is polished in astronomy, uh, uh, a core in physics department where they polish mirrors wonderfully. So we leverage that. And that sends an image all around the rat, including his own shadow. So we can see his own shadow. And that's how it looks. So it goes around and he sees, and there's a very compelling sense of something coming in. Even though we just opened the flap from behind, it looks distorted, but trust me, it is undistorted in reality from his point of view, where he's at the center of the universe. So when he walks, things go all around him uh, and it's pretty compelling. Just take my word for it. And he buys into it. He runs around very happily. So this is like a human being sitting there with a virtual reality goggles. A human being may not be able to see their hands in VR, let alone see their feet. Whereas here, the rat can see all of it. So here, the rat has to simply go underneath this weird pillar to get a bit of reward. And I'm going to lower the volume so you can hear it. So let's get going. Does the rat buy into it? 
So he's held in one place. There's a wet camp above him. Uh, and notice he goes underneath this pillar. There's a little bit of sugared water that gives him reward. And while he's drinking water, the pillar, virtual pillar, goes somewhere else. Watch his head. Uh, he's moving his head. Looks at the pillar. Checks if there is reward. Looks at the pillar. Checks the reward. So he's clearly going there. <clears throat> What about area around him? Can he perceive the edge of his virtual world? To do that, the pillar is behind him. He sees this from the corner of his eye, by motion parallax, turns away, goes to the pillar once again. So he is creating a three-dimensional concept of space just based on light. So this was so interesting. I'm going to show you the one last little bit. Now the pillar is again behind him. You can see him looking around. Second time he goes, he knows the edge even faster than the first time. He goes forward. So these videos are there on our lab's web page. Uh, if you go to the media section, you'll find it. Uh, you can watch them creating a concept of space using only vision. And we know for sure that there's only vision because even though there are smells and texture on the ball, they don't have anything to do with where he is. So we now know that the rats can create a concept of abstract space using this made up stimuli. And in fact, the pillar never comes near him above or above him. So there's only empty space. The pillar is always on the screen around him 50 centimeters away. So he's able to create this abstract concept of space. What do the neurons do? Let's listen to, in fact, using this technology, we can listen to the same neuron in the real world or virtual reality. Can the neuron in the rat brain, even though he's behaving as if it's real space, can the neurons in his brain tell apart that this is not real reality, this is virtual reality? Perhaps one of the biggest abstractions that we all think of, how do we know the world around us is real and not a simulation or not just imagination? And under some unfortunate diseases like schizophrenia, People lose sense of what is real and what's not. They imagine things that happen that are real rather than other way around. So let's listen to one neuron from his brain. So this is the activity pattern of one neuron when the rat was running around in the virtual space. This thin green pink line is his trajectory. You can see he was going everywhere, collecting rewards. He was quite happy. He was not starved before because he even took naps there. And each dot is a spike from one neuron. And you can see these dots, you don't have to know any fancy math of information theory and so on, that this is pretty much garbage. The spikes are occurring all over the place. Compare that to the same neuron that we could tell apart out of a million to say it's the same neuron. That neuron in the real world, not just that, but all the neurons have nice pristine map of the world in virtual reality there is almost no information. Even when you combine the activity of hundreds of neurons, you still have no idea where you are. So something very dramatic happened. We thought, many people thought that rats cannot perceive space or time based on vision alone. They are olfactory creatures. They are nocturnal creatures. They live in burrows. Well, they can perceive the so-called edge of the table without even tactile information. They can perceive a pillar which doesn't exist at all. They can navigate perfectly well, <clears throat> but the concept of space within neurons is completely busted. They seem fine. They don't seem lost. But are they really lost or not? And what happened here? And what about this space here? How did that come about? So I want to wind up this quickly and start telling you a couple of quick answers and puzzles. So let's listen now to that one neuron as the rat was running and pay attention to the sounds as well. The sounds are interesting. Notice the rhythm going on. It's not random. And it's a motif. It's a long burst of rhythmic activity. So we are speeding this up once again, uh, so that we don't spend all day here. What you must have felt if you are musically trained is that these neurons 
this neuron has the same rhythm as the real world, but the rhythm is slowed down just a little bit. And you know how it is when somebody is not keeping the rhythm by the smallest amount. The rhythm slowed down by just about 10 to 20 percent. Whenever the neuron was active, it was always active for about the same long motif, which is about two seconds long. And if you listen to the same neuron that was in virtual reality, which was completely is concerned, two second long motif, which has all kinds of additional structure, which I will not get into now, the same structure exists in the real world too. So it turns out that these neurons are actually encoding delta T or delta X. And they're combining this delta T and delta X using some metric that we still are going to figure out to create some kind of space in the real world. But in virtual world, they're creating some other kind of space that we don't understand using this metric of delta X and delta T. Now, what about memory? Turns out that people, every drug that is developed for any medication is tested in rats by asking them to form a map of space. And people know that rats are smart. They can cheat by putting scent marks. So they put the rat in a uh, tank of water and they have to escape to this hidden platform that is buried underwater so rat can see, based on the cues on the wall. The problem now is that in this task, the rats are afraid. Even you'll be afraid if you had memory problem and to diagnose with that you have memory problem or not, I were to throw you in a tank of water, cold water, and you are almost drowning. That's a different memory than walking around trying to remember what's the name of your friend or what you had for lunch. So now we are asking the rat to actually tell an abstract spot in space without any pillar. Can they do this? And the answer is yes. And that's the answer is in this. Uh, interestingly titled paper called do the legs know what the tongue is doing the answer is no so he's walking around there are no pillars to tell him it's an interesting board there are sounds of different creatures frogs crickets so on he even stands up to look around as if it's a real world they stand up to look around uh, and he's lost because there is no pillar to tell him where the reward is it's a predetermined location uh, it's like that. It's a predetermined location. It's a top-down view, and he has to go there. And once he reaches, we give him a signal to say you reach there, and then we teleport him to another place, maybe here, maybe here, and so on. And he has to go back to that spot. And you can see the different paths he can do that. Second time, he's doing much better. He reaches there much quicker. He gets a reward. Gets teleported. So clean experiment, no human intervention, and so on. Very quickly, I can tell you that knowing where you are, even with the highest precision, is not good enough. Once again, like quantum mechanics, if you want to know where to go somewhere, you have to know the momentum, not just position. You need to learn causality. Uh, you need to predict the future. If you simply perceive where you are, it's no good. You need to have information about where the reward is. Where is a bad thing? Where is a good thing in, that, uh, in the space and so on? How do these neurons represent what was the action that they did and what was the outcome? This is called predictive coding in more fancy terms, which is the major thing that goes into self-driving cars. Because self-driving cars, a major industry, has to figure out what to do, when to brake, when to accelerate, when to change lane where before it's the uh, things happen in the world so that predictive coding in a simple theory i developed a long time ago in 99 when i was at mit the same place where dr pradhan went uh, where i learned uh, the experiment part uh, that can do this with a single neuron can learn to predict the future based on past experience and that still works Without again spending much because we are running out of time, when the rat sleep, we can monitor the activity of the same neurons that the rats are running in the maze. And during, let alone the REM sleep, when the rats actually have conscious dreams, like humans, when if you wake up somebody from REM sleep, and REM sleep is called REM sleep because it's called rapid eye movements, the eyes move under the eyelids. And if you wake up somebody, they'll tell you, I was having a dream. And they can describe the dream, but that's just 10 or 20% of sleep. 
80 to 90 percent of sleep is so-called non-REM sleep, where there is no REM. By definition, the eyes are not moving. These neurons during the non-REM sleep are in a very noisy fashion. The rat's brain is traveling through that space. And we can decipher it uh, that what is the rat's brain thinking of going during REM sleep as well as non-REM sleep. And it turns out that during the non-REM sleep, the rat's brain goes through the same experience he had in a very noisy fashion, but 50 times faster. How does it go so much faster in REM sleep, not doing real behavior, and what role it has in memory? If you're curious, you can read this or many other articles, but I won't go there. Uh, and I want to tell you that this during non-REM sleep, you can model the activity of the entire brain using an extremely simple system, just two neurons. Of course, there are billions of neurons, but if you take only two neurons, one so-called excitatory, other inhibitory, which is true in the brain, when the excitatory neuron is active, its effect is to inhibit everybody else, sorry, excite everybody else. When the inhibitory neuron is active, its effect is to inhibit other neurons with only three linear differential equations. These are all additional terms which are inputs. There's only a relaxation term and a bunch of coupling term. With that, you can show that the brain for the entire eight hours, or so maybe seven out of eight hours, when you sleep at night, behaves like a two-state system. Active, inactive, active, inactive. It switches between that, and this simple theory captures it and it does far more interesting things during sleep as well that I don't have time to get into, but you can look it up in our papers, some of them are published. And I want to tell you finally, uh, can somebody mute their phone perhaps? Uh, there is one more thing that happens, which is we were monitoring this, but we looked at the fact that these neurons are very special. They have these huge dendrites, and that's where the synapses are. And the idea has been to say, okay, the cell body is what generates spikes, zeros and ones, but what about all these other wires? Are they simply cables, as everybody thought, that synapses inject current into this? The currents travel all the way here, and then the cell body puts it together and generates a spike or not. Is this giant infrastructure doing any computation or is it just a pipeline or a cable? Until recently, people used to think these are just cables. All the computation happens in the cell body. But we were curious to say, is that really true? So we modified these electrodes and turned them into something like chopsticks. They can eat noodles. Chopsticks are very, uh, have a little gap and they can pick up noodles. And these dendrites are like noodles. They can trap them in using some additional Kirchhoff's laws and so on, basic physics. You can decipher the activity and nobody was able to measure this activity in dendrites because if you, you cannot just poke a wire in it, because these are one micrometer thick. With one micrometer thickness, if you use the standard electrode and poke it, it's dead. As soon as I move my head, the head moves, the brain moves by 50 micrometer, and there's a needle which is one micrometer, neurons get dead. So what we did is to make these very springy, in a whole bunch of mathematics so that the little dendrite is trapped and the whole thing sloshes around with the brain and doesn't kill it. So let's listen now to the activity of this memory making, memory making part of the brain, which nobody had measured before in live animals. And does it sound like a cable or not? So that's the idea. Here is that neuron cell body where the spikes are recorded, they look like that. And through some math and so on, um, and experiments, here is how it sounds. So let me pause that here. At the bottom is the standard signal that you heard before, the very high frequency sound, one kilohertz sound, from these neuronal spikes from measuring outside. This simultaneously is the signal measured from a dendrite. And you can see instantly, it does not look like the standard cell body signal. As I showed you in the very first video, in the cell body, the membrane voltage fluctuates by about 10 millivolt. And then there's a gigantic 100 millivolt spike. Here you have gigantic subthreshold fluctuations. That's number one. People didn't know that the voltages fluctuate by such giant amount in their rights. And on top of it, 
there are spikes in the dendrites. So these cables, which are supposed to be passive elements, actually they are generating their own spikes, which increases the computational capacity of the brain massive because each neuron has a thousand micrometer of dendrites. And they sound different. These are not the same spikes as the cell body. So listen to them again. You can see it's a different thing. It's a much more low frequency sound. And hopefully this is on YouTube. So next time you watch this, you can put on your subwoofer based headphones and listen to this signal. You will detect interesting patterns. There is a lots of interesting science to do about this. When we put it all together, when the rat's going around, the memory looks far more complex and abstract in nature. But again, I don't have time to get through this. Uh, I want to throw this image again, and I challenge you not to see the dog. Even though I have been bombarding you with information about other things, you cannot unsee the dog. So that's the mystery. What is the next thing that we are interested in? If the dendrites are so interesting, what about the microscopic unit of the neuron? The little ion channels, these things are nanometers in size, and they let ions in and out of neurons. This pore is nanometer in size. Single file sodium and potassium ions can go through this. Now we have to understand this structure, which is allowing either sodium ion in and nobody else, or similar structure that allows potassium ions to go out and not something else. That's fascinating, because this is now at the edge of quantum mechanics. Single ions and not even too many ions going through. So after many, many years of this journey, we are getting through this, uh, trying to understand what makes brain special, where do abstract ideas arise, and what is intelligence. I have not found an answer, nor has anybody else yet, but hopefully I give you flavor. Let me wind up by a few things and few tips for you that you can do to make your brain healthier. Number one, if you want to make your brain healthier, every now and then stop using the GPS on your phone or anything else. Try to use your own brain to navigate. Turns out, the same circuit that is used for making maps of space is also involved in understanding this conversation that we had. Same neurons do all those things. And as you know, the more you use it, the better it remains. So rely less on GPS and other technology. Use your brain to walk around. Take a novel path and see if you can find your way. Pay attention to your breath. Brain consumes a hell of a lot of energy. And oxygen is needed. So never skip on your breath, even though I'm pretty much out of breath right now. Water is crucial. Drink plenty of it. Whatever is good for your body, especially for your heart, is good for the brain and vice versa. Sun is extremely crucial. Now, most of you live in India and you are fortunate to have sun throughout the year. Staying with the solar cycle, all the different clocks in the brain that go all the way from brain to the body, they get synchronized spend at least 15 minutes in the sun each day. That will do lots of wonders for your brain, not just anything else. Use it. Use the brain quite a lot. Walk around. Try to do things and eat food with decent fats. In fact, bad fats too are not so bad except trans fats. So eat food with fats and avoid sugar. Move at any cost. Use muscles in different ways. Dance, uh, that will rewire your brain. If you get a chance, definitely take a hike. Way more important than anything else. Every day, set aside some time to create new things. However, use less. Scribble, write a random poem, maybe compose a bit of music. However, uh, horrible, it's definitely going to be better than what I do. And never skimp on sleep. Uh, extremely important. Uh, more research shows that during sleep, your brain neurons create space between them and all the nasty metabolites, including Alzheimer's disease causing proteins are flushed out. If you don't sleep, that flushing out doesn't happen and things go haywire. So I hope that this has given you a flavor of things that we do. 
and I'll stop here and take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for a fascinating and very engaging lecture. I'm sure all our neurons were firing all the time and we did not feel uh, slow or sloppy and definitely not sleepy. So <laughs> the session is now open for discussion. So I'll request the audience either to type on chat or you can just unmute yourself and directly speak to the speaker. You can raise your hands also. Okay, can I can I ask a question? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Hello, sir. Thank you for a very wonderful talk. Uh, I'm PhD student at Department of Physics. My name is Chintamani Pai. Uh, sir, I have a question. When you spoke about the binary aspects of neuronal, you know, firing, and uh, we think of neuron as a basic uh, computing unit. So, what are typically the quantum aspects we should look at into neuron? And is there any way, like I'm going to my second question, that we can externally actually manipulate with this neuronal firing to create a new memories in the brain? Yes, actually so manipulated. very Thank good you. questions. Thank you for asking them. So quantum mechanics is very close to my heart, but right now the first answer that I would give that anybody should give is that there is no room for quantum mechanics in the brain because thermal noise is extremely large. And when thermal noise is so huge, there is no room for quantum mechanics because the quantum fluctuations are orders of magnitude weaker. But at the same time, I'm very puzzled by these ions, which are selecting specific types of ions, and they're letting them through in one way or the other. So I don't think that this is as simple, but we need to look at it. So rather than going to the brain and say, I want to look for quantum mechanics, or I want to look for something else, we should start from the, as they say, we should not put the cart before the horse. We should not approach the brain based on what we like or don't like. We should approach the brain from what it is and say, these are the facts that we know. Let me understand how this works together rather than any preconceived notion of I should do something or not. We can have a guess as to what may happen, but we should not have a guess as dominate uh, what we do. So second question, can we implant memories? Absolutely. Uh, by now, people have found ways through novel techniques where you can actually activate a small number of neurons artificially by electrical stimulation or the latest thing called optogenetic stimulation where you infect the neurons with certain ion channels and you can shine light of different colors and selectively activate different neurons. And the bottom line is that by activating only a handful of neurons, people have shown that we can convince a rat that some place in the world, which previous day was nasty, he didn't get any food, and maybe that place was had a bad smell. Next day, we can reformat the memory. So the next day, he thinks that that's actually a nice place. And this is amazing work done by Tonegawa Lab and so on at MIT and elsewhere. So yes, right now, these things are possible. Uh, so in terms of technology, like genetics for the brain, Technologically, we can do amazing things. So we can fix Parkinson's disease right now. The only surefire way to fix it is to put tiny electrodes in one particular nucleus and pass one kind of current and the Parkinson's memory is kind of cured or fixed. But the main challenge is to understand how does it work and how does the brain do these interesting things? That's still a challenge. Anything Thank else? You, sir. So in the chat, there are a few questions. Yeah, let uh, me take a look. Uh, can I ask a quick question? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, Penrose has this idea that there's a quantum mechanical wave function collapse equivalent happening in the brain. Yeah. What happens. How close are we to checking whether that is true or false? Yeah, actually, interesting enough, I mean, I admire Penrose. He's a brilliant man. Uh, and I read his book, actually, The Emperor's New Mind. 
uh, when I was thinking whether I should stop this wonderful world of quantum mechanics and field theory and go into this insanely difficult world of the brain. Uh, I remember many discussions with Rangawala. I used to go by his office when I came home and say, is this really a good idea to do this? And he said, no, it's still, you got to keep going. Uh, so he had an interesting idea, so-called one graviton hypothesis and collapse of wave function. He had other interesting ideas about microtubules, which are some structures within neurons that so-called backbone of neurons to some extent that can do something about consciousness and so on. But in my humble opinion, uh, it's none of those. Uh, there are many things that we cannot explain. And I know that many people are curious about consciousness and we think it's there, but I think that just like human beings made tremendous progress by studying the inclined plane in a pendulum, before they jumped on to who am I, we need to pace ourselves and learn how to ask the questions about what is consciousness and how we can measure. But that will not dissuade many of you. So I would say if you're interested in consciousness, consider this. At this moment, every part of your body is sending information to your brain. Every part of your skin is sending information to your brain, whether it's a pressure of your shirt or the pants or the eyes are sending information, ears, nose is sending smell, and still all that you seem to be aware of is what I'm saying. So the real challenge for the brain is actually how to be unconscious of the vast majority of things that are happening. That's the real challenge. In fact, right now, if you were to be able to perceive every single thing that's happening to you, you would not understand anything that I say. So if you want to go down the path of consciousness, I suggest you start with unconsciousness. And that's why we have been studying anesthesia for some extent. Anesthesia is where we know somebody is unconscious even though they are not there. So turns out as soon as somebody gets anesthetized or starts to fall asleep, the entire neocortex starts to behave like a two-state system, not a non-state system. So if you're interested in that, look up our papers about up and down states if you search or slow or sleep or email. Anything else? Uh, somebody mentioned about uh, Neuralink uh, and can we connect a computer to the brain? Not really. So far people have, there are so-called motor cortices where there are one giant patch of neurons that encode arm movement to the left, other giant patch of neurons encode arm movement to the right and so on. And because of the giant organization, that huge number of neurons which are right next to each other do the same thing. People can put electrodes in them and when they stimulate one patch of neurons, all the left uh, arm moving neurons become active and the person moves the hand. So that is possible. But the kind of brain machine interface at the level of memory, that's not even within the foreseeable future. So to, sorry to say that those claims are false, to put it simply. It's just happened. Sir, there is also a live YouTube stream of this lecture going on and there is a uh, question on the YouTube channel uh, that uh, if we were to imagine the brain as a hard drive, then how could one imagine the data being stored physically? I mean, what is Very the good. Very good question. So the analogy of the brain and computer, as I have tried to show you, starts to break apart early on. And I've been seeing Abbas Rangwala's hand coming up, and I am so glad to see him after so many years. And I definitely want to hear his questions. I hope I can answer that. Uh, but in the brain, the fundamental thing is the part, the software and the hardware are not separated. That's the bottom line. In the computer, somebody writes the software. And the software is more or less installed, the hardware remains fixed. Nobody really wrote the software for our brain. Maybe genes did a little bit. Surely genes gave us some, they hardwired some amount of software into our brain. But the connection between neurons are highly malleable. That's where the memory is. And these connections are the ones that determine what will the activity be. So the, the, if we were to use the analogy of the brain, 
it's a computer where the software is modifying the hardware constantly and the hardware is then soft modifying the software. So it's an entirely different thing, which is what makes it really special. Professor Anwala, uh, please ask this. Hi, Mayank. Hi. Wonderful talk. Wonderful talk. I mean, I have just two very general um, questions which has bothered me for a long time. One is that, um, I mean, it's probably not directly related to your talk. <clears throat> Would you say that all there is that to life is physiochemical processes? Um, because my second question is related to that. I mean, in the sense that, you see, there are, from time immemorial, there are two schools of thought. One says, all right, everything is going to be physics, chemistry, processes taking place in your body, brain, and ultimately that's what will give you, for example, um, uh, your physiology, emotions, intuition. There's nothing like intuition, for example. You would ultimately be able to decode it, you know, kind of thing. Would you say, I mean, what's your take on this? Thing? Because uh, if it is true, I mean, if there's all that is there to physiochemical basis to life, then the next question that a corollary that comes up is the following that uh, we would be able to create artificial life with which will be you won't be able to distinguish between, eventually between human beings and such life created and let me put the second question also uh, along with it is this uh, that um, how come nature creates all these things so very easily if i may use the word you know okay. yeah so yeah fascinating questions uh, great to see you after so many years you haven't changed a bit i'm glad that's true <laughs> <laughs> you are not Always the only coming. one to say <laughs> and i have my response <laughs> to that thing <laughs> which i have given wrong back and got straight yeah. to the heart of things uh, thank you so I first of all must say that I don't know. That's a straight and short answer. I don't know. I have marveled at these things quite a bit and puzzled over these things. So I definitely don't know. This is way below my pay grade. But since we are amongst friends, I'm going to speculate why. Yes, yes, um, please do. That's just, what yeah, I would like. just speculation. So the first thing that I would say is that Something about the brain is very surprising to me. What? Something about the brain is very surprising to me. So what do I mean by that? So look at the, the jaw of an ant, right? Ants, first of all, they're amazing navigators. They can find their way in the world. You know, your brain can have tons of ants. So somehow the desert ants can do amazing things. They can find the ways somebody did interesting experiments. They can count distances. We know ants can count distances. So this whole business of space and time uh, and its universality across brain structures which differ by several orders of magnitude. Ant brain is, I don't know, a thousand neurons or so. Human brain, 100 billion neurons. And we agree, <clears throat> despite such huge difference in scales, experiences, and so on. There is some commonness. There is some agreement across creatures on the planet about space and time and many other things. And that bothers me. Bothers in a scientific sense that it, it's a happy thing to think about it when you go to sleep to say, what the hell? Am I just uh, kind of overlooking something fundamentally? So that's one. Number two is the same thing I mentioned, ants jaws can jump way faster than a millisecond. So why when evolution can do all these amazing things, why is it kept to neurons so slow? Kilohertz, that's very slow. <clears throat> so now that's the big picture thing. Going back to your question, question number one, is it 
is everything to the brain simply electricity and chemistry or is there something more? Essentially, that was a question, right? Uh, my thinking is, and I'm fairly convinced about it, that let's just look at a solid, right? A solid is a weird thing, right? A solid is a weird thing because I am holding this thing here and the, I'm able to control that thing so many huge number of atoms away in a reliable way. Solid is a funny thing that we take for granted. Uh, I think it's just familiarity and I think the brain is a system that is not in equilibrium because we know based on, if it was in equilibrium, then there is no learning, there is no change. So we need the brain, the individual elements are very simple. And you know, as well as anybody else knows that even bunch of spins, zeros and ones, when you put collectively together, it behaves in fascinating way, including something like a solid. I think that in the brain, we need a new kind of science, a new kind of science where we don't look at deviation from equilibrium as perturbations. We look at the perturbations as the thing. We look at the noise as the thing. It is not a bug, it's a feature. And when we start thinking about it, this collective dynamics of so-called noisy and sloppy systems, we are calling them noisy, we are calling them sloppy because, because we are using our experience and our mathematics, which is deterministic. So when we start fundamentally, and that's what I am after these days, uh, working with many bright people, and I think there is tremendous place for neuro, for physicists to step in here. To say, I'm going to look at a system where disorder, sloppiness, noisiness, slowness is a feature, rather than a deviation from something ideal. I think that's where we will understand what is so special about it. And just like I cannot even begin to talk about why this is solid without understanding quantum mechanics and so on and collective system, we are not there yet. So that's one thing I would say I'm fairly confident and I'm certainly investing a lot of effort in understanding in that way. <clears throat> and the second part about intuition, uh, that's a very good question until pretty much I would say about 10 years ago, people used to look at the brain as tabula rasa or a blank slate. So we are sitting here, we just have eyes, eyes and let's say just vision, it's just a camera, whatever comes in, comes in and then you perceive. But the fact is that even when we sleep, the brain is active. Your body stops most of the things except your legs and arms, they don't move around your heart and lungs and so on go around, but even they slow down, but your brain continues to use energy throughout sleep. Even the visual part of your brain, which your eyes are closed, the room is dark, it's pretty much just 10%, 20% less active than when you are awake. So, and we know interesting things are going on there. Many people have done research, but I feel that in the next decade or so, not much longer, people will realize that it is a handshake. Just like when we, in the old days, when people used to do this internet thing, you know, we used to dial up and there was this weird sound and some little phone dial up will make some handshake where you, where you send message and the message comes back and say, okay, now I heard. There is that intuition is not just something that happens rare. It's all the time, it's just like unconscious mind is there all the time and we rarely feel the conscious mind. That intuition business is there all the time. And if we have time someday, I can show you why even right now when we are talking, we are using intuition constantly on a millisecond to millisecond basis. And that is a, is a fundamental thing why we can do things. But that's a long answer. Maybe someday I can get more into it or if people are interested, I can hold forth more to why the intuition is going on right now when you're here, but I'll take other questions. Dr. Thank Radha Srinivasan, uh, Madam, please unmute yourself and uh, speak. Radha, Madam, are you there? 
So while somebody is waiting, let me oh. show you that experiment, all right? I want to show you the intuition business right now. So I have to move this computer away from me. Imagine you are sitting in front of me at about this distance, all right? And I'm going to ask you to do a very simple experiment. It's pretty mind blowing if you think about it. Here is my finger that's moving in front of me at the speed of less than, uh, I don't know, about 25 centimeter per second, all right? Imagine you're in front of me and I ask you to say, as soon as I say go, reach out and touch my finger. You can do it, no problem, right? Big deal. But let's think through how exactly it works. So let's discretize the problem. At time t equals zero, my finger is here. The image falls on your retina. The photoreceptors transform that into spikes. The spikes travel through hundreds of brain areas. It goes through all the motor command is generated based on the sound to say go. It goes through the muscles and then you make a movement. Now, even if you are the fastest monkey, uh, no disrespect, monkeys are pretty fast, or Bruce Lee, as I was in martial arts, it will take you at least 250 milliseconds to reach out. You don't think so, but it's true. From the moment I say go, to the moment you initiate the response, not reach, the moment you initiate the movement, from the moment you say go, is 250 milliseconds. In 250 milliseconds, with an average speed of this much, my arm, my finger has moved by about this much distance. You should be constantly doing this, constantly falling behind. You're not doing it. Guess what? You're not born with it. If you have a little child at home, baby, an infant, you can take a piece of candy and move it in front of the child. They will actually go behind. They haven't figured out the map. They haven't figured out the laws of gravity, the laws of their movement. So this kind of a thing, this handshake or the prediction about, I saw something in the world, the next thing that's going to happen better be this. And I am always acting on the world that I'm expecting to be rather than the world that is. Because if I were to act on the world that is, I will be dead. I'll not be able to walk, I will let alone language, but I'm making sounds that you understand, you parcel away, and so on. I can play tennis, I can travel by local trains, nothing. So this is in, in our bones, in every neuron, in what we showed recently, is every part of neuron, this dendrite business is able to do this so-called very quick turnaround from something came in, the next thing better be this. And that's a new kind of science, uh, technically speaking, we can call them strongly coupled, strongly interacting systems, where the departure from the mean is not the right description. Uh, the next question uh, by Dr. Radha Srinivasan, her mic is not working, so I'll read out her uh, question that she has typed in chat. Uh, she says, a question based on my observation of the experiments of nerve potential measurement by patch dam technique. The Sophia College Life Science Group with the IFA had done some measurements. So she is asking, uh, where are we in such measurements, more complex systems or advances in measurement techniques? Yeah, so patch clamp technique uh, was discovered by Bert Sackman and Erwin Mayer. Um, it's a fascinating story for people who want to understand the brain, uh, is how does one go about understanding the brain? So what was the technique? So if you were to take a sharp electrode and poke the neuron, neuron dies because nobody likes to be poked by a sharp thing. So people wanted to make a connection with the neuron to listen in to what's going on inside the neuron, because as we see, neuron is pretty large and complex. So Sackman and Nair and I used to, I, am a, I used to collaborate with Bert Sackman for many years. So we used to have you know, lunch meetings and he used to tell me how he used to work. So he and Erwin Nair used to sit in the basement and it was supposed to be the technique of poking the neuron work reasonably well, sharp electrodes. And they could do reasonably well, but they wanted to create a way in which the electrode gets stuck to the neuron. So-called giga ohm seal. So it, the electrode gets stuck and there's a tiny hole and the electrode is in contact so the liquid doesn't ooze out. So for years together, all that they did is to sit in the basement, make pipettes after pipettes, 
find different ways to polish the tiny five to 10 micrometer surface of the pipette. Keep trying better and better until they figure out some fancy little trickeries that they could do this. Now that led to, of course, the Nobel Prize for discovering patch cam technique that told us all kinds of amazing things about ion channels, my favorite obsession these days and so on. But that is certain, like everything in life, every great thing leads to next challenge. The patch clamp technique people have used even in a rat brain, they can patch a neuron when the rat runs around and find this so-called place cell when the rats are running around. So beautiful experiments. But the difficulty is that still that pipette is gigantic and the rat's head has to be fixed. And our head, as soon as I move my head by this much, the brain is sloshing, very squishy. So if there's a big fat pipette and something sloshes around, neurons are dead. So patch clamp, if you want to measure in vivo, 20 minutes and by the time the neuron is dead, maybe half an hour. So now we have a problem that does not really work. So we have been trying these basic physics-based ideas to say, what if we use Ohm's law? Why do we need to poke something to measure what's going on inside? We want to poke something. What really happened when I poke something? The neuron, inside the neuron, there is liquid. The pipette is filled with liquid. Liquid has high conductivity, but the membrane of the neuron is fatty. That's low conductivity. So when I put a hole in it and put liquid to liquid contact, I can measure what's going on inside because the resistance or the impedance from the medium outside versus the impedance inside is much higher. So what we have been playing is with the idea that what if we go the other way? If we can't poke the neurons and reduce the impedance between the electrode and the neuron, can we go the other way where we put the electrode near the neuron, the impedance is still high, but increase the impedance in the surrounding medium? Kirchhoff's law doesn't care. How did you reduce the impedance compared to their amplifier? As again, Dr. Nursade taught me very well. So in those uh, RC circuits that I was soldering for years, thank you again for teaching me that. So what we've been doing is instead of poking this and reducing impedance, you increase the impedance of the median around it. Then you more or less achieve the same thing. And that's the technique that we used in the latest paper in 2017 to measure what's going on inside the dendrite without going inside the dendrite. Because what happened was the surrounding impedance went up. Now your voltage divider circuit, you can measure what's going on inside. So if you're curious, uh, go take a look at that paper. It's in science in 2017. It's a little technical, but should be readable. It's basically Ohm's law and a little bit of jugglery because we wanted to find what are the things in the brain that are high impedance uh, and so on. Um, but it works. In fact, patch clamp technique can record the activity of neuron even a slice, maybe for 20 to 30 minutes, or maybe an hour. With this technique, we could measure the activity not only of cell body, but of the tiny piece of dendrite for four days, which is a massive world record. The rat is running around, he sleeps, he dreams. We can monitor the membrane potential of that process for four days going. So we're now going for doing that for hundreds of uh, dendrites simultaneously and coming up with ways to make sense. So it's both experimental and theory. Somebody's microphone is... Yeah. Can you please uh, switch off your mic, please? Uh, I think Hari Tejas Ayer, uh, can you please unmute yourself and ask your question? There are a couple of questions. We'll take a few more. Uh, Hari Tejas Ayer. Okay, if he's not there, uh, we have Amay Kulkarni and Sabya Sachi. There was a quick question about optogenetics limitations uh, that I see here. The trick people do is to activate neurons of specific types. Uh, you can tag, you can infect ion channels to specific types of neurons, but it's a good question. Yeah. Anybody else is asking question while I read questions here? Uh, 
I think that person's mic is not working. Yes. So he has a interesting uh, question. Hello. Yes. Can I, I'm Sarvay Sachi. My I can't come yes. on the screen because my bandwidth is very low. Okay, you can speak, please. Uh, yeah, yeah. I am an anthropologist. And I learn a lot from your lecture about how to think about how the mind works, how cultures work. Uh, I've been reading about Freud. And uh, there is a discussion between a, psycho and a psychiatrist and a neuroscientist with His Holiness Dalai Lama, in which the Dalai Lama asks this question about the unconscious and what the neuroscience has to say about this. Could you enlighten us about this uh, in some way? Yeah. Uh... Again, I would say I don't know because. Would you like to so, a bit? Sorry. Would you like to speculate on this? I, I'll speculate, but I want to make sure that I make it clear what is speculation versus not. So I will now go ahead and speculate a little bit. So Freud mentioned this idea of the unconscious, um, and it's clearly there. Um, I just showed you an example of unconscious. I don't know if you're able to see my demonstration of a finger moving around and you're trying to catch it. Yes, you I don't did. perceive, you don't perceive that the finger has moved on. You just think you are you you went to touch the finger, no matter how much you introspect. You feel that you went to touch the finger, but you did not. So it's there all the time, uh, even in the simplest thing, such as reaching out to touch a finger. As I mentioned at the other part in my talk earlier, that the remarkable thing to me is not that we are conscious of few things. The remarkable thing to me is that we are unconscious. There is some editor in the brain uh, which is able to say all these things are irrelevant. I'm not going to ignore them. I'm going to ignore all of them until there's a tiny ant on your foot. Even though you have no idea where your foot is, that tiny sensation, you instantly will notice there's something happening. So, and you will respond to that. So I think uh, this comes down to how, if I were to, and clearly there is something like unconscious. In fact, the other way around, vast amount of things are unconscious. I mentioned that the concept of space, as far as neurons are concerned, uh, even 100 neurons have a better idea of where we are than we ourselves consciously with all the millions of them. So why is that? And this is true for all parts of the brain. Uh, neurons collectively have far more accuracy than us put together. So again, my thinking will be, why, why is that? Why, why, why don't we have conscious access to everything that our brain knows? It's possible that there is the idea that all the more information, the better is in error. Just like we just introspected that if I were to be aware of everything, it would be much harder. If you want to imagine that once again, imagine asking a centipede, how are you walking? Probably going to be impossible for centipede to walk if it was going to pay attention to how it walked. So it's possible that the brain is not just maximizing information transfer as many of us try to quantify how the brain works because the way we quantify it is to say here was information from the senses how well did the neuron transfer that information into spikes to the rest of the brain maybe the brain is doing something else which is so-called compression which is what this computer is doing right now every pixel on the screen that is going through the camera is not relevant so there's this JPEG compression going on so that the background doesn't have to be encoded much. It's just the background rather than black, 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 brown, and so on. So the brain is actually not simply representing information. It is constantly transforming information. In fact, if you were to think about that, if your brain were to simply represent information, there should be a fat copper cable between the eyes and the hand. But that's not the case. And there's a reason for that, which is that we are always predicting the futures. And that's where the introspection and knowledge comes in. So that's my short uh, rambling version of the unconscious, which is that that's the real puzzle to figure out. And then 
the consciousness will be self evident thank you so much it helps very helpful thank you very much we uh, have actually lots of questions but we'll take the last two uh, from vibha brahut yeah yeah, yeah. vibha uh, brahut and vibhas sir uh, yes dr raut uh, yes uh, sir i have a question uh, from a physics point of view so uh, can we study i mean are there any development in the direction of studying with the collective behavior of neurons from the quantum statistical mechanics point of view where we can use the data from the mris um uh, i we are certainly using uh, many of the physics techniques to understand the data i showed you today the data from single neuron at a time because that's all we have the time for but we and many people in the world by now have the ability to record the activity of hundreds of neurons at the same time and we certainly are developing techniques to make sense of that pattern there exists uh, simple techniques which are well known based from very simple thing like population vector and information encoding to something very complex those things by far exist but we are going to the next level of thing there is certainly a lot of uh, what should i say room for making sense and again if i were to pontificate a little bit about where we are right now compared to where physics was i believe we have entered the golden age of neurophysics imagine the time at which uh, the telescopes became available in history and people started to notice all kinds of things planets and their trajectories and the moons moving around and so on and then came kepler way before newton who started to look at the trajectory of some planets start to come up with some invariant laws such as two thirds power law that led eventually to newton and einstein and this completely non intuitive idea which is quantum mechanics and relativity neurophysics right now is at that golden age the techniques to measure the activity of huge number of neurons in animals while the neurons are not injured while the subjects are doing very interesting complex tasks that have become pretty widely available but the ability to decipher the pattern the ability to come up with a simple theory which is not just departure from the mean but the fluctuations are the real thing that's uh, where in my opinion there is tremendous room for advancement and i certainly am investing a lot of effort in it so if you are interested in it by all means get in touch with me okay thank thank you so much sir and i just want to briefly because you said that it's not you know very well possible to connect computers or chip with the neurons neurons as uh, neural link and other attempt were done so have you had an opportunity to talk to these people or you know kind of uh, 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 people from the neural links no i haven't had opportunity to talk to them uh, but you know there are thousands of neuroscientists and if they are interested i am more than happy to speak with anybody whether they are student or alumni thank you and more than happy uh, sure absolutely i haven't had okay. a chance to okay thank you so uh, final question we'll take the last question uh, vibhas nag can you please unmute yourself and yeah. speak uh, so i'm a student of third year biology from zavier's college i have a basic very basic question so last uh, day i was studying about cerebral organoids and we know uh, that uh, we know that cerebral organoids uh, we can create a particular cortical layer of neurons and different type of neurons so and i was also reading about the artificial intelligence stuff that is going all around so i was yeah. just speculating like if both of this together merge up somewhere or integrate somewhere down the line uh, in the near future so what yeah. are the what are the limitations or what are the challenges we are going to face in this integration of both these two or how difficult is this integration going to be yeah fascinating question thank you and i'm very glad that you are keeping up with the latest in organoids so for those of you who may not know this uh, this is a fantastic development from biology side where people have found through amazing experimental techniques they have taken neural tissue from very early stage they able to grow the brain in a dish 
And I don't do that, but there are lots of brilliant biologists who do. I'm collaborating with some of them to understand how autism spectrum disorders arise, which arise earlier on in the development. And people have looked quite a bit into autism spectrum disorder, and they can't really point out one chemi particular chemical or one particular neuron that's damaged. And the most prevailing idea is that it's the network that somehow untuned or detuned. So that's certainly a very exciting idea. There are many interesting implications. People can now take tissue from the human skin or human stem cells and grow human brain in a dish. And right now, I think the oldest brain growing in a dish is like a year old or something. Pretty gigantic, like, I don't know, half a centimeter or something. So that raises many interesting questions. Some of them are ethical say, can that tissue have consciousness and is it fair to grow it? I think uh, probably not true. If anybody has uh, uh, what I should say concerns, ethical concerns about any neuroscience experiment, these or others, then the first thing they should do is to stop eating meat and protest against anything, any meat consumption, because that's totally unnecessary. But it's our prerogative to do that. I'm not saying you go out and start picketing against that. I think we just have to, life is, you know, made up of judicious choices. We should not look for perfection. We should look for how to do the best given what we have. And finally, people are able to grow organoids on a little of tiny, tiny electrodes. So they are connected to those electrodes, thousands of them. And I think that's a fascinating direction. We are doing some of those things as well. But I still feel even with the organoid, let alone human brain or something connecting the chip, the main thing is the fundamental thing about the neuron. Each neuron is getting input from 10,000 neurons and it's giving output to 10,000 neurons. So until Professor Nursale teaches me how to solder 10,000 wires to a neuron, I don't think anybody's going to be able to do that. Uh, so that's the biggest challenge there. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, 